What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Tuesday, May 7th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, replacing a Talon Energy coal-fired power plant with battery storage is infeasible, according to PJM. Unbelievable. Next up, friend of the show, Gregory Wright Stone. Scientific report pulls cold water on major talking points of climate activists. Next up, Biden administration bans fossil fuels in federal buildings. Unbelievable. Finally, in the new segment, surprise, the world's biggest bankers are suddenly energy pragmatists. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets today and cover what happened um, mainly with Saudi Arabia's price increase, which, according to the article that we will cover, might indicate an oil price floor. We will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Let's kick it off. Hey, let's start with this one here. Uh, replacing Talon Energy coal-fired power plant with battery storage is infeasible. PJM. <laughs> Let me read you this quote from PG, PJM. While a battery, a uh, large battery could reduce the severity of reliability concerns in the Baltimore gas and electric system following the eventual retirement of the Brandon Shores and Wagner units, the battery concept would not replace the needs for a reliability uh, run agreement or address the system reliable needs in the near or longer term. Bottom line is it comes down in here and says it is highly unlikely that a battery system could be built by June 1, 2025, when they plan on taking these out. You know, holy smokes, Michael, that is like, it would also cost a billion dollars to build a 600 megawatt, four hour battery system, more than the planned transmission upgrades and proposed battery storage. None of this is fiscal responsibility for BJM. No, I mean, if you... Shocker. Renewables aren't fiscally responsible. Could have told you that. Uh, yeah. Uh, the uh, FERC uh, approved a $796 million package of transmission projects to address the plant's retirement. That doesn't cover a cause, a fourth of what they need. Yeah. Uh, what I what I can't figure out is why the Sierra Club's got their fingerprints all over this. Aren't they an environmental organization? They're supposed to, but they don't realize that natural gas will have actually, if they allowed natural gas instead of the battery to come in, it would actually save the planet and kids. It would. It, 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 uh, it, it. You know, the I, Sierra Club is, is actually funded. I, I would like to go check. If anybody is listening to the podcast, if George Soros is funding the Sierra Club, uh, please send us a note. I would like to send them an invite to come on the podcast because I think this is despicable. Yeah, absolutely. All right, what's next? Let's go to our buddy over there, Gregory Wrightstone, who's the director over the CO2 uh, Coalition. Uh, scientific report pours cold water on major talking point of climate activists. And uh, Ms. Producer, if you could bring up uh, our uh, Ms. Greta there, uh, I can't pronounce that michael how in texas how would you say so geek a luke you know I, school crest i don't know i don't i know don't know means. but um anyway the purveyors of climate doom will not tolerate the good news of our planet thriving because of modest warming this is actually pretty funny here's a quote uh from uh the lancelet chan uh public health uh he says uh the the potential health consequences are large, given that there's already billions of people around the world who don't get enough protein, vitamins, or other nutrients in their daily diet, concluded the uh, New York Times. Uh, apocalypse ever. Yeah, it, it it's unbelievable. It the is. so-called greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide perversely exaggerated to support climate Fear-mongering is a life-saving temperature and moderator that keeps Earth from freezing over. 
The obvious benefits of CO2 is an embarrassment to the large and profitable movements to save the planet from carbon pollution, writes the authors. If CO2 greatly benefits agriculture and forestry and has a small, benign effort on climate, it's not a pollutant. <laughs> I mean, we, we've been working and, and we, we were working with Gregory Wright Stone years ago when he was one of the first people to this. He originally wrote a book, then he came over and is now leading the CO2 coalition. He was one of the first people ahead of the game on this one. Oh, he is. And I, I, I've already reached back out to him and said, hey, dude, it's time to get you back on because we're yes. going to get him on the uh, energy realities as well, too. It's a hoot. I, I got to give him a shout out for this one. Yeah, absolutely. What's next? Speaking of fools, uh, fossil fuels, uh, Biden administration bans fossil fuels uh, in federal buildings. I'd like to rechange that to the Turley administration bans fossil fools, F-O-O-L-S. Uh, I Anyway, the 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 rule mandated by the Energy Independent and Security Act of 2007 requires federal buildings to phase out fossil fuel by 2030. Uh, cleaner energy. Uh, it means nothing. There, it just means that when they try to do a building, the Department of Energy has faced delays in implementing the rule due to opposition from natural gas utilities concerned about potentially business losses. The American National uh, Gas Association criticized the final rule. This is not about rule. It's about the uh, utilities are not able to keep the lights on. Yeah. It's, well, it's, I think this, they're going to end up obviously kicking the can down the road on this. It's one of those things where they, Propose it. They'll probably have an implementation period. And then when that implementation period comes up, they'll do kick the can down the road. Oh, yeah. But I, I really want to just say I have this story on here, Michael, just so I can say ban fossil fools, not fuels. Uh, Absolutely. I and I love how executive order 14075 and other for famous sustainability plans. The new rules aimed at the goal of achieving net zero emissions by 2045. What happened to I thought it was 2030. Um, they're kicking the can way. They just put, they launched it in 105 millimeter and launched it down. All right. Hey, let's go to the last one here for me. Surprise. The world's biggest bankers are suddenly energy pragmatics. I'll tell you, JP Morgan, BlackRock are out of the climate banker cabal and admit net zero transition is delayed. Um, I'll tell you what, I think this is pretty am uh, amazing. Three of the four largest financial houses in February left the financial cabal called the Climate 100. The fourth one left a year ago. BlackRock, J.P. Morgan, and State Street all parted ways with the Billionaire Club. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, it's coming apart. And now they're saying, oh, wait a minute. We you and I talked about this for a year they, they were closetly kind of like sneaking in and, and doing closet investing in oil and gas. Now they're pretty well. Uh, well BlackRock's open. always done that. We know BlackRock's always yes. been closetly invested in oil and gas, but they've been hard on the ESG side. The interesting part is, you know, Jamie Dimon has sort of been on the forefront of a lot of this stuff. He's come out. We saw him battling in front of the House um, committee. Was it last year when he said, right. Um, uh, you know, it would be the road to hell in America if we yep. if we ended up just sticking um and, and getting rid of oil and gas. So he's always been on the forefront of some of this stuff. Well, I do want to I want to question Jamie Dimon. I'm I'm either I'm hot and cold on Jamie. Uh, one day he's I'm over there rooting at him that he's standing up for what's right. The next day, uh. But last Thursday, I saw him interviewed and he said, oh, by the way, um, uh, the American consumers are still fine. They're still living on their COVID money. How much money in COVID did you get? Twenty four hundred dollars two years ago? Yeah, no one's still living on their COVID. No, money, I was like, dude, what are you smoking? Wow. Anyway. So then you have BlackRock, and uh, I, I just love this article. So 
anyway, thanks for letting me rant today. Yeah, no, uh, we'll go ahead and, and pop over to finance here. Before we do that, guys, we'll pay the bills around here. As always, check us out. World's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis that you hear is brought to you by that website. Again, www.energynewsbeat.com. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Um, you can also hit the description below links to all of the articles and timestamps if you are on Spotify and YouTube. You can also check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. You know, in, in terms of, of, of the markets today, Sue, we saw about a one and a half, uh, a 1% increase in the S&P 500, NASDAQ up 1.1 percentage points. We saw two and 10-year yields held pretty much flat. Dollar index basically flat. We saw Bitcoin drop about $500, $63,466. That's off the halving. That happened last week. Crude oil saw modest gains. We're up to $78.48 as the markets uh, closed here as we record this uh, Monday afternoon. It was up about 4 uh, or uh, 0.47 percentage points, so just shy of about a half a percentage point. Mainly as, as you know, it, it comes down to there's, there's a couple things pulling on this, as we've talked about. There's a lot of stuff pulling on the supply and demand projections, a lot of this being what's going on in Gaza right now. Um, it looks like the ceasefire that was going to happen, that they had maybe agreed upon, seemed to have, have pulled back a little bit, and that may or may not happen now, at least the market sentiment that way. So we did see a little bit of reversal after really what was three straight weeks of of, of oil and gas prices absolutely getting pounded, you know, to kind of that ties in with what prices are doing. Saudi Arabia's price increase could indicate an oil price floor. This is the next article I want to cover. Um, over the weekend, the state-owned, and I'm reading straight from the article here, state-owned Saudi Aramco raised the June official selling price of the Arab light crude for customers in Asia by 90 cents, the $2.90 a barrel the, uh, above the regional Oman Dubai benchmark. And this is according to Bloomberg. That compares with an increase of 60 cents forecasted in a Bloomberg survey of six refiners' prices. Um, if we can go and sh uh, drop that uh, table right there, you can see the other price changes for all of the the other grades from super light all the way down to heavy the interesting part is is what this shows and what they're 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 keeping that is that and and this is kind of again straight from the article the hike highlights saudi arabia's efforts to keep the market tight amid the fading war risk in the middle east which has helped drive oil prices lower most traders and analysts predict and this is the key that opec and the signal of these raising the official selling price and that is that OPEC and the patrol uh, OPEC and its allies will extend their cuts potentially to the end of the year. And um, you know, this is a I'm trying to find the the guy's name here. Um, Bloomberg Markets Live reporter uh, Garfield Reynolds. He says that there's a decent chance it's busy finding a new floor rather than settling for its sustained declines. And notes that the Israel Hamas. Okay, agree on a truce. Um, this would likely set off a rapid fresh drop in the short term for crude. So Saudi Arabia, possibly by raising this official selling price, is trying to set a floor on where oil prices could be, whether that's 70 or $75. It's going to be interesting. You know, obviously the war in Gaza will eventually come to a conclusion one way or the other. At least we hope so. So the question is, is Saudi and what is OPEC doing in the short term to attempt to support that. It looks like they may come out and go ahead and extend these cuts um, through the end of the year. But but that that's going to be interesting and in how that plays in with the overall economy and has remains to be seen. So I, I think it's interesting, Stu, and I do think that um, as we continue to roll and learn more information every day, we're learning more information about where prices might go. It it's 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 getting spicy out there, and I think it, it is. And I think that uh, Saudi Aramco, another article Michael came out. And uh, Saudi Aramco talks uh, in talks to buy shell gas stations in Malaysia. So what we're seeing is some of the big oil companies like Total, like Saudi Aramco with state-owned Saudi Aramco buying other downstream assets in order to help offset some of their business so that they can still bring profits in. Yeah, it. It it really does, and you know it, it. I think the answer remains to be seen. And as always, we'll continue to learn more information. Um, kind of short for us today, Stu. You got anything else? No, buckle up. It's going to be entertaining.
That it will. So we'll let you guys get out of here on a short show. Appreciate everybody checking us out here on the world's greatest podcast, Energy Newsbeat. Thanks for checking out, as always, www.energynewsbeat.com. Until tomorrow, folks, we'll see you then.